It is essential to hear God in the noise and confusion of this time. Otherwise, you are sure to be deceived. Welcome to Current Affairs with Sam Solon as we explore the revelation of God in this season. When we left off the last time, I was about to delve into the blasphemy of the of the, the the mouth, which is one of the seven horns that had been given a mouth, or one of the ten horns on the seven heads that was given a mouth to speak blasphemous things. Again, I say that's by the very content of speech, we may properly infer this is the religious head. And here, the goal of the religious head is to practice deception. But in order to do so, it must negate the truth and it must negate those who accurately represent the truth. And it must do so in a combination of ways. One is perhaps a way and its anticipated effect. The way is to assail the truth and those who carry the truth, number one. And number two, it's a calculated effort to secure popular support. So if you, if what you say resonates with the world, it will increase support for the beast. But in doing so, you must marginalize those who are not compromised. Now let's look at the, let's look at the scripture. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. So the blasphemy is against God. To blaspheme His name. There, whenever we speak of the name of God, we're speaking of His authority. Things that are done, Jesus said, Whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name. Same concept. That is, you're coming by my authority. The disciples observed when Jesus had sent them out, the 70, they observed that at the mention of the name of Jesus, demons came out of people. We have been specifically commissioned to operate from our position in the person of Christ. And that's the principle that is embodied in the notion of God's name. So a blasphemy of God's name, these blasphemous things you see are not They're cunning, crafty things. They're not overt. And one of the most crafty has always been a supplanting of the authority of Christ Himself. Constantine offered and the early church accepted the power of the Roman government. Roman military, Roman finance, and the rest of it. At that point, they didn't need to depend upon the authority of Christ. So, when you blaspheme the name of God, you're attacking His authority. And the attacking of His authority is to neutralize the Great Commission. He sent them out, sent out His disciples and by extension He sent us out, recognizing always we are clothed in Him. 
This is the sending out. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. The sending out referred to in John 20, 21. And in John 17, Jesus said, praying to the Father, all those whom you have given to me, I have kept by my name. Let them be one, he goes on to say, as you are in me and I am in you. So the name of Jesus is also a reference to his body. It's implicit, it's an implicit reference to his authority. Those who are called by his name. Later on you will see that they are those, those with the name of the Father on their foreheads who are in conflict with those who have received the mark or the name of the beast. Okay? So blasphemy of his name is a direct attack on our empowerment and more insidiously, more insidiously upon our, our, our identity as the assembled people of God, as the assembled body of Christ. So denominations will be allowed to continue to exist so long as their power comes from the state. This is how the blasphemy against his name will be undertaken practically. There will be legislat legislations governing what you can say and the notion of what disturbs the peace will be widely defined to include things commonly associated with an identity as an assembled member of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you noticed how the big fight in the evangelical church, one that made it all the way to the Supreme Court, has to do with, quote, the right to assemble? The argument at the present time that captivates the church, fires the imagination, that argument is about the right to gather on Sunday mornings. That's a red herring. The real assembling is by being placed in the body of Christ by the Spirit of God, being the family of God. The fallen church doesn't know the difference between meeting on Sundays and being assembled. They're saying, God commanded us to meet on Sundays and you are denying us our religious liberty. No, God commanded us not to forsake the assembling which is being accomplished by the Holy Spirit, bone to His bone, where we are connected in the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with a church building or any kind of building. Now, I'm not against buildings. They're useful for all kinds of things. They're useful for having weddings if you want to have a wedding outside of the elements. They're useful for parties and celebrations. They're also useful if a group of believers want to meet in a building. But to say God commanded that as the assembling, you simply don't understand the scriptures. There is a permanent assembling into the Corpus Christi, into the living body of Jesus Christ. What is assembled are individual members and it's a permanent assembling because you're put in the place that was designed in which for you alone to be put. 
If you forsake that, then you're out of place and you're disconnected from the authority, the power, the resources that are in His spiritual self which empowers all things in your life, both spiritual and natural. That's the assembling. So the blasphemy is against His name, which also flows right into the next thing that He blasphemes, His tabernacle, which is God's tent or dwelling. Where does God dwell? I am mystified, frankly, that preachers would readily agree that the building is not the church, it's not the body, but would insist that it is how the body is functionally. Now, human beings put their bodies in houses, But is a house the way the human body functions? No, it's called a house because it provides a a necessary shelter from the elements. When you are not there, is that your body or is that how you function? No, you have portable functions. You go and you do as He leads you. I mean, When Notre Dame, the cathedral, the French national cathedral was destroyed, there was a wail in even the Christian church about how this great edifice of God had been destroyed by fire. Well, it would seem God was napping if this great edifice so important to Him was allowed to burn. One young preacher trying to justify it, talking about how great the craftsmanship of this building was. And when challenged about it, his response was, well, it's the best that people had to offer God in those days. The best of, whenever has God been impressed by the best that a child has to offer? When is that the pleasure of God? No, it's not your works, it's who you are. It's like the time when my young son Nick at the time brought a fistful of dandelions to his mother and she put them, Lucy put them in a vase uh, in the kitchen where she could see them. And for a moment the thought occurred to me, I was wasting money buying her roses because She didn't seem to treat them with the same deference and delight that she did this fistful of dandelions. Well, you get the point. The dwelling place of God is where the Spirit of God has assembled a people who then corporately, even as they are individually, filled with the Spirit of God. Why is the tabernacle of God so important? to God. And why should there never be a conflation of the dwelling place of God with any structure made by human hands, which has been specifically and expressly addressed in Scripture as a, not a place where the habitation of God occurs. He never dwells in a temple or a tabernacle made by hands. Why does He make His own? Because of the original intent, of course. God intends, the invisible God intends to become visible in an assembled corporate man. It was His stated intent originally. Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness and let him have dominion, etc. Why is that so? Because the Son, this corporate Son, is the radiance of His Father's glory. It's it's what is referred to as Zion. 
the point of origin from which the glory of God is emitted into creation, into the earth. The sun is the radiance of His Father's glory and the sun is the exact representation of His Father's being. So the tabernacle of God is indispensable to the original intent of God. The tabernacle carries the glory of God in it. That is why the glory of God in the wilderness remained in manifestation above the tabernacle. Why would there be blasphemies against the dwelling place of God? Because institutional representation of God can be so easily corrupted because institutions are about rules, law, restrictions, all of which are designed for control. So you can control God. (laughs) The absurdity of it is, is obvious on its face, isn't it? That's like putting a hand on the Ark of the Covenant. It'll get you killed every time. The dwelling place of God is spirit to spirit, for their life is imparted. The Zoe life of God, eternal life, is imparted from the presence of God into both the individual parts of this corporate man and the entire corporate man in a fashion suitable for the tasks associated with the corporate man, all of which tasks in a singular reference suggest the presentation of God out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. That's where God Himself shines, that's the location from which God Himself shines forth. So it is the target. But why are we surprised? Would not the offspring of the the serpent, which is this beast of seven heads and ten horns, is it not its destiny to make war against the offspring of the woman? Of course, this is just how it's being conducted. So now the interesting thing for me is that it says, he opened his mouth. And in opening his mouth, he speaks against, he speaks, or the implicit, the implicit reference here is the blasphemy is spoken blasphemy, and it's against the, the authority, the scope, the order of God's name. And then it's about, it's an assault upon the corporate man, the dwelling place of God. And then the third thing it says, and against those who dwell in heaven. Now, where are we seated, I might ask, now, in the post ascension period? Where are we seated? Where do we dwell? We are seated in heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. So heaven, heavenly, in the reference, those who dwell in heaven, is a reference to the kingdom of, kingdom of God because it's also called the kingdom of heaven. It, it's on the earth, yes, But its power, its authority, its glory, its the identity of those who dwell, all are heavenly in their origin. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, as we have borne the likeness of the man from earth, so also we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. 
In our flesh, we are like Adam. In our spirit, we are from heaven. We are like Christ. So the dwelling place of God, wherever God dwells, is the heavenlies. I'll go further than that and say, wherever God dwells is the holy of holies. And He does not dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells in a holy people. And wherever that holy people resides is heaven. Their, Their kingdom, while they're on the earth, is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus made it clear, He said, My kingdom is not of this world. So to dwell in heaven is synonymous with living in the kingdom of heaven while we are on the earth. Now this is a war of words. It's a war of words, it's blasphemies. So what might you suppose is the uh, uh, the contents of these blasphemies? Well, it's already self-evident. I find it fascinating, the structure of this passage, that he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God And then what does he do? What does the writer do? It explains what that looks like. When you blaspheme against God, you blaspheme His name, you blaspheme His tabernacle or dwelling place, and you blaspheme those who dwell in heaven. That's the the content of the blasphemy. Having understood that to blaspheme His name is to speak against what was, what was accomplished by Christ on the cross, the authority of Christ. It's to empty the cross of its power. Now how might you empty the cross of its power? By going back to law. That's what Paul said to the Galatians that if you return, if you return to the structure of law, whether it's Old Testament law or the law that is the reflection of a code of societal conduct, the, the foundation of that notion is the consensus of mankind about what godliness should look like. So it's a secularized gospel. It's a secularized gospel. What might that look like? What is the sound of a secularized gospel and why is it blasphemy? Because it makes man the object of that gospel. It removes the focus from obedience to God obedience to Christ. It removes the focus from being transformed into His image and likeness. Hey, you're just fine if you give money to the poor. God loves you. Look look at how wonderful you are if you will just do good things. It's blasphemous. Why? because it has put man in the center. And you as a practitioner of this secularized gospel can ignore God altogether so long as you do that which is approved by society. They do not even regard the name of Christ, the authority of Christ, as having any relevance at all to this gospel. Again I say, this is what Constantine offered. 
the power of the empire. Just go through the rituals, the empire will pay your bills. And as I said earlier and we'll come to it later, spirit of Babylon, it's about your provision, your protection and therefore it has to be about everybody's provision and protection. This is how you blaspheme His name, this is the content of blasphemy. When you speak about His tabernacle, His dwelling place, it'll be about how God is found in all religions and how dare a certain group of people, especially a disgraced group of people, claim that Jesus is somehow superior. Where Jesus dwells or where where Christ dwells, in the midst of His people, according to Hebrews chapter 2, He will stand in the midst of the congregation of His brethren. That will be the subject of blasphemy and and it will be that God is wherever you see God so long as He's earmarked by good works. And as to those who dwell in heaven, they will allow that there is a spirituality in the earth, but witches and and witchcraft will be just as valid a form of quote spirituality indicating those who dwell in heaven as readily as any other form that by which you might identify someone as being a heavenly type of person. So none of these things are new. Okay? These false gospels are centered, as we are showing, in an attack upon his name or his power, in an attack upon the corporate man, in an attack upon our point of view, how we see things, whether we see things from an earthly or a heavenly viewpoint. That attack has already come, but it's nothing like what it's going to increase to become. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, which is not that he dominates them or changes their gospel, it's only this, that in the propaganda war, the saints aren't going to win. We're not going to win the popularity contest, only a remnant will emerge out of this as the chosen bride of Christ. I want to unpack a little bit more further the next time when it says, all who dwell on the earth will worship Him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain. So you will have two types of people, those who dwell in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and all the rest, they're the ones who dwell on the earth. That's where you'll find the unsaved and the religious alike to dwell on the earth. I don't have time to open any more of this. When I come back the next time, I want to say, I want to give you a, an, an understanding of verse 10, which says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. In other words, people who are used to taking others captive will themselves be taken captives. And he who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. People are used to killing with the sword and I'm not unpacking that now, they will be killed by the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This was the warning that I just read to you. This was the warning 
that the prophet Jeremiah gave to Israel in Jeremiah the 15th chapter. And I want to show you how that applies in our time in this context. But until then, may the Lord bless and keep you and I'll see you the next time. I'm Sam Solon. Bye-bye. Thank you.